Thank you, uh, Ellen, for that kind introduction, and a big thank you to the uh, Federal Reserve and the Family Housing Fund for hosting here today. You know, I was, I was just taking a look at actually the, the title up there, which is Expert Insights on Inclusionary Zoning, the key word being expert. You know, this is not an advocacy nor opponent organization. This is, a, this is a, an orchestration of a whole bunch of different ideas and players all rallying around a common cause, which is to get clear facts on how to tackle a very serious crisis in the area of affordable housing. Uh, and, you know, the concept of inclusionary zoning, to say the very least, is a complex and nuanced one. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to start a rally cry like you would, for instance, like a $15 an hour uh, it, around inclusionary zoning because you need to account for a, a balanced approach, making sure that you have adequate supply and that that supply is going not just into high market areas but also areas that don't traditionally get the additional density. Uh, and creating a chant around that, I don't know, I'd give somebody a thousand bucks if they figured it out, but it's not, <laughs> it's not going to happen really easily. And so, so to have kind of everyone here at the table, uh, different ideas and mentalities and backgrounds is undoubtedly the, the right way forward. Um, now, in, in Minneapolis, we do have at least a, a preliminary uh, inclusionary zoning ordinance passed by the council. I want to uh, thank Council Members Schrader, uh, who is presently here, as well as Council President and Lisa Goodman, who were here just shortly ago. Um, and, uh, and I want to thank the, the broader, both philanthropic, nonprofit, and development community as well for kind of participating as, as we work our way through the process. You know, it was told to me the other day, and, and I couldn't agree more, that inclusionary zoning is one tool in the overall cornucopia of different affordable housing approaches that we have available to us. And at the city, you know, we're, we're, we're hitting on all of them. You know, we're, we're working with MPHA, and thank you, Mr. Russ, for being here. We're, we're working with the state to make sure that we have the necessary uh, funding of, of low-income uh, tax credits, both 4% and 9%. We're trying to get that additional monies from the, the federal government, which is, for the most part, dried up uh, and since, you know, the 1980s. Uh, and, yes, we are also adding our own policies at the city. Uh, the affordable housing agenda that we have at the city is, is divided into kind of four key parts. There's four key parts. You've got additional affordable housing production, being the first big one, and, and not just production at that 50 and 60 percent of area median income level, which is where we've traditionally gone, but also that deeply affordable housing at that 20, 30, and 40 percent of AMI, which is really hard to get, especially without significant subsidy to bridge that gap between whatever constitutes the market rate and the affordable rate. So a big concentration there. Also, making sure that we'll have affordable housing production throughout the city, not just doing it all in North Minneapolis or an area where the land costs are cheaper and the political pushback is perhaps less, but areas of middle and upper income as well. Uh, that's the first big area. Second big area uh, is naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and retention of naturally occurring affordable housing. And interestingly, there's kind of a really, uh, there's a symbiosis here between how inclusionary zoning can be handled and the preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing. And interestingly, they don't always work together. I was talking to Mr. Joseph Paris just a second ago, and one of the interesting uh, dynamics is that, you know, as as it becomes more difficult, not to get a developer, but to get financing for new production of housing, that investment could shift towards already existing housing. And when that investment shifts to already existing housing, the formerly naturally occurring affordable housing then becomes less affordable because the granite countertops are thrown in, you suddenly you got an organic fruit on the, on the counter and, and the, the prices get jacked up and jacked up until you know, you'll no longer have naturally occurring affordable housing. So how do we secure both new production and affordable in naturally occurring at, at, affordable at the same time? This is an interesting balance. Uh, third big issue, which we has been talked about, I think the most surprise is is is, uh, is home ownership, especially for communities that have traditionally been left out of the equation. And I'm talking about our Black and Indigenous communities of color. Um, I did not realize that huge swaths of the inclusionary zoning production has gone to uh, ownership. 
uh, I, I guess I hadn't really seen that at all. Um, but when I look back on it, you know, I grew up in that mid-Atlantic area just outside of D.C. where I grew up in Fairfax County, uh, where you had, yes, production of rental as well as production of affordable. And it was seamlessly kind of done into the community at the same time. You know, I, I've... I remember having an argument with my with my mother about I, I was working in a, as a server at the time over in Tyson's Corner at this lunch outfit, and um, I remember telling her, "Yeah, there's like a lot of new affordable housing that's going up in here." She said, "That can't be possibly be true. Uh, can't possibly be true because she's used to the affordable housing in the Section Eight that had gone in in Queens, where she's from, which looked affordable." Um, it looked like it was lower income, but suddenly you've got these relatively fancy buildings that are going up and, you know, 20 percent or whatever the percentage is of the units are affordable. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and it was working because that demand in that area was really sky high. Now, that doesn't mean that demand is sky high everywhere. That doesn't mean that every single neighborhood of every single city can accommodate the additional supply while also requiring the affordability. Uh, but it was an interesting, an interesting dynamic there. Uh, the final issue that we've got is tenants, tenant protections. Um, and we've got a program, uh, and you know, we've got a program called More Representation Minneapolis uh, that is making sure a pro bono attorneys can 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 work alongside our tenants and, and keep them in their homes, you know, even when they're perhaps dealing with an unscrupulous landlord. Uh, so you got those those four corners there, uh, and and IZ policy is is something that can work when done well with the kind of an, a cornucopia of of options. Um, the big thing that's been addressed multiple times here is how do you do it in a way that doesn't limit the supply? Um, you know, the, the, the supply is, is one key element of the overall equation, and there are clearly cities and municipalities that have done it well, and there have been cities and municipalities that have failed. And we obviously want to be one of the former. Um, and that, that supply dynamic, you've seen it play out in multiple cities throughout the country. One of them, uh, you know, I, I saw this study just recently um, in, uh, that, that, that showed that, that cities like uh, Portland and San Francisco, whereas previously they were seeing upwards of double-digit rent hikes on an annual basis, I'm talking about 10% average rent hikes on an annual basis, are now down to somewhere in the range of 0% or 1% rent hikes on an annual basis, and a big part of that is production. Um, the production of new housing, whether that be affordable or market rate, uh, and the additional supply finally meeting the demand for housing has led to a stabilization of the, of the rental market. Now, that's one piece, uh, but then you know, the other piece is how do you capitalize on that massive amount of supply, making sure that you're getting not just the market rate, not just the 150% of AMI, but the, the, the affordable as well. And that's kind of what we're trying to tackle here. And the way you tackle it is by getting all of the experts in the room. Um, and so you know, we, are, we are committed. We at the city are committed to, to working with people here. Uh, we are committed to working with the Fed. You know, the Fed has been a very trusted partner, um, not just to do the implementation and the assistance of creating a policy, but also in reviewing the application and efficacy of that policy. Um, you know, they're doing it right now with minimum wage. Um, we, we, we'd, love, we'd, we'd love to partner with you on figuring out how an IZ policy would work as well. Uh, and. And having these different partners in the room is the way you get to, I think, a really, a really good result. So I, I, again, I want to thank everybody for their time here. Uh, we, wanna, we want to institute with a really fact-based and results-oriented approach. Uh, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate the partnership. Thank you so much.